Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hamid Dehkordi, and it's my pleasure to interview Dr. Shayan Sharif as a part of CSPC 2023 series. Dr. Sharif is the interim associate vice president of research and a professor of immunology. Uh, his, re his research is focused on avian influenza and investigating ways to control through developing novel vaccines. Dr. Sharif was inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy. Welcome, Dr. Sharif. Well, thank you very much for having me. Greatly appreciate that. So as a first question, uh, how do you see the role of research uh, research in the universities like University of Gulf in shaping science policy at the regional, national, and global uh, levels? Uh, well, I, just to begin with, universities have always played a role in shaping science policy, even though sometimes uh, they may have done that inadvertently, but we've always been involved in shaping science policy. But I think, you know, with some of the challenges that we're currently facing, including, for example, climate change, pandemic, pandemics, socioeconomic inequities across the globe, food insecurity, just to name a few of these examples, universities need to play a much more active role in shaping science policy at all of the various different levels at the regional, national, and global levels. And also on top of that, we need to create a a, 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 a much better platform, an agile and robust platform and strategy to prepare our universities and the next generation of our thought leaders for the future um, uh, issues, emerging issues and problems that we are going to be facing at the university, at the university level, and also at, at, the, at the more general level within um, Canada and also beyond the borders of Canada. So based on what you explained here, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the second question I have here is, uh, what do you think uh, on the current state of uh, science policy in Canada and any specific areas where you believe there's a room to improvement for future e investment? I know that you mentioned some of them in the first question, like the pandemic si situation and climate change, but I want to be more specific here. Is there, what do you, what do you think? Is there any area that needs to be fo focused more or because of some problems that we have these days, now they are in the corners and we do not look into them? Well, I think, you know, I can't really say, um... Uh, I can't really say that any of those problems, you know, have already been solved. Unfortunately, pandemic, maybe, you know, COVID-19 pandemic is gone, but there is going to be another pandemic. And I think, you know, the fundamental question, perhaps the existential question is whether or not we are ready for the next pandemic. I don't really think that we've been able to address the issue of climate change to any significant extent. Socioeconomic um, uh, inequities, we haven't really addressed those either. Food insecurity is also another issue, both here in Canada and also across the globe. And we haven't addressed any of those to any great extent. And there have been a lot of gaps in, in science policy in Canada and perhaps globally. I think you know we've taken a lot of really positive steps to, uh, towards addressing them. As an example, it was the appointment of Canada's chief science advisor that I believe made a very important, it, 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 it sent a very important message and it made a very important contribution to how science policy is formed here in Canada. But I think you know, there is certainly much more that we can do. I think there is a need for having a two-way dialogue between governments at, at all various three different levels that I mentioned before, regional, uh, uh, regional, local, and 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 national and global. And I think you know we currently don't have that sort of a two-way dialogue between those levels of government and post-secondary institution like my university here at Guelph. And um, you know when you think about it, after all, we are all serving the same people either locally, regionally, or nationally. So there has to be a multi-sectoral approach towards the way we are addressing some of these big, what I call them, wicked issues and problems, and creating a pipeline for candid and transparent conversation within this ecosystem is, is becoming much more critical for us. So I think we need to stride, um, take some, uh, some actions in order to be able to address that. And, and I don't really think that we need to have a huge amount of investment because whenever you think about, you know, the, some of the investments that we have to make for infrastructure, for expanding our infrastructure or for expanding our, our research programs, they're in the billions. But I think, you know, in order to create a pipeline for dialogue, we don't necessarily have to make a huge amount of investment. We can probably 
you know, do it rather quickly, but it does require a significant amount of goodwill, collegiality, and perhaps altruism, and putting things aside and working together in a collaborative and collegial manner to address some of these big issues that we are currently facing in Canada and also globally. Great, great. Thank you so much. I believe you somehow answered my third question because I was about to ask about some strategies that you're thinking about. Um, they are effective for building uh, the gap between scientific research and science policy uh, implementation. So um, now I'm probably going to ask a small question here. So at the University of Gulf, uh, what do you think? Which of those strategies uh, already done to fill that gap? Or uh, Because I think, uh, I believe, uh, we cannot create a general case and try to generalize it for all the universities and uh, academic institutions. Probably we need to look into that regionally and uh, find some uh, strategies for them, discuss with them and see how we can uh, do those gap, uh, fill those gaps. So what do you think, uh, what uh, University of Gulf has done already to fill that gaps or what it needs to do there? Right, I, I, so that's a that's a fantastic question and I completely agree with you. We can't really be everything to everyone. So there has to be some level of specialization within regions and, and uh, within regions of Canada and then perhaps, you know, for Canada as one nation among the other two over 200 nations across the globe. So at least I'm looking at it now from the point of view of universal welfare. Uh, one of the top thought leaders in agriculture and in veterinary medicine, and in, in, indeed uh, my home my home college of the Ontario Veterinary College is number one in Canada and it's number third in North America after some of the, the, the most notable and most renowned universities in the U.S., uh, University of California and also Cornell University are number three in in North America. So it is a, 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 a the place. It's the hub for um, excellence in veterinary research. Our agriculture is also among the top in the world and one of the I would say top tens here in North America. So our agriculture and veterinary medicine are obviously at the forefront of research excellence here in Guelph. But I can I cannot under under um, under uh, estimate the importance of other aspects of our research uh, here at the University of Guelph, and we're uh, our research is propelled by uh, an agreement that we have with the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs that allows us to operate many different research stations, agricultural research stations. Also, it allows us to have the uh, animal health laboratory here in Guelph, and also the agriculture and food laboratory, each of which provide significant amount of service to the people of Ontario and provide uh, information to our policymakers in order to make policies and inform their policies for the future of the province. But um, in terms of you know more specific areas within Guelph, obviously agriculture, as I mentioned, and within agriculture, we can look at food security and sustainability as two of the main areas within agriculture. In case of veterinary medicine and veterinary research, we have multiple different areas, such as, for example, antimicrobial resistance. We also have uh, preparedness, emergency preparedness for emerging diseases, such as, for example, avian influenza virus, which as probably you and many of the audiences would know, it's been going around here in Ontario and also in Canada, and it is indeed a major cause of concern, not only for agricultural industries, but also for public health and human health. It hasn't had the um, opportunity to jump from animals to humans, but I think it's a virus that can never be underestimated. And we have programs here in Guelph that, uh, would, uh, that are trying to address that issue, the issue of uh, controlling this virus and making sure that the, the, this virus would never get a chance to jump from animals to humans. So these are some of the areas that we currently have. And I would also put many of these smaller areas under the auspices of the so-called One Health. One Health is essentially an approach to integrate the intersection between animals, humans, and the environment that we live in in order to, in order to be able to address some of these. Again, I'm just going to call these some of these issues as wicked problems. 
the problems that we can't really solve with just one solution. There is no simple solution to solving those problems. And also we can't really do trial and error. And a, a good example of it is a pandemic. It's not, we are not gonna be able to find a solution to a pandemic. It's a multifaceted issue and it requires a multi-pronged approach. And One Health is essentially an area that we are trying to excel at. And One Health can actually be used in order to look at things in a very holistic manner, in order to be able to address some of these wicked problems like pandemics, like climate change and so forth in a very holistic manner. So as I understand, uh, as you said, uh, one of the uh, probably strategies that the University of Gulf had to fill that gap was two-way conversation with the government, uh, with the policymakers. Uh, so I just want to know, uh, just based on the same question that I had, uh, uh, how, how fast... What uh, you know, we have uh, many challenges. Uh, we need sometimes we need to react very fast. It cannot go through different levels to do the policy making, like what happened in pandemic uh, in COVID uh, 2019. We in some areas we need to react. We need to decide fast to help everybody. So, what do you think? What's the best strategy to do that? I know that in a long term relation, probably we can build up something that we fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, have you ever thought about that? How we can look into this, uh, like in a short term uh, solution? Yeah, so that's also an interesting question that you're posing. So there, I would say probably there are two or three different things that we can, and we've already done some of it. I, I do really think that we need to have strategies for emergency preparedness because, you know, the pandemic happened quite unexpectedly. But as a matter of fact, we knew that there is going to be a pandemic. And as a result of that, there were emergency plans put together by scientists, by researchers and policymakers. Uh, then the question is, did we actually follow those those emergency plans? And I think you know that's an entirely different different discussion. The reality is that during what I call peacetime, like for example, right at the moment that we have at least some uh, some quiet time that we we are not quite done with COVID nineteen pandemic, but and it's still present, quite live and well. However, it's not really causing a significant amount of issues for the population here in Canada and elsewhere. So that's why I call this, you know, a relative peace time. This is actually a good time to develop relationships between universities and those policymakers and try to ensure that these uh, relationships come to fruition if and when needed. This, the time for developing a relationship is not when we are facing with an emergency. This is actually a good time for us to do that. The other thing that we have to do, and I think you know, some universities and some other organizations have taken steps to address that, is that in universities as a whole, we are not teaching our students. We teach our students based on disciplines. I'm an immunologist, viral immunologist, and I teach immunology and virology to some extent. So my students understand viral, uh, virology and immunology. They don't necessarily understand policymaking. And I think, you know, we usually ignore that, we neglect that, because we feel as if, you know, everything has to be done in a disciplinary manner and not necessarily working with our students to enable them and empower them to use their knowledge in order to inform policies or make some change in the board. And I think that's the critical aspect that universities can and have to do. That's the, that's the place that we've been lacking for the last probably several generations. Universities are generally speaking places that generate new knowledge and communicate the new knowledge with peers, but not necessarily very effectively or very purposefully with the public or with industry or with policymakers. And I think you know this is really an area that I feel that there is a gap and that gap needs to be filled somehow, somewhere universities need to do that. When I spoke about a two-way street between policymakers and universities, I really meant what I meant. It has to be a two-way uh, street. It, it has to be a dialogue. It can't be a monologue of us telling policymakers what we think. There has to be also them coming to us asking for, for advice, and they've done that. And I think the pandemic was actually a good example of that. And in reality, in my university, we've created a, a policy fellowship 
uh, for policymakers, for managers within government organizations and so forth to come to our university just to get a better sense of who we are, what we do, and also get a better sense of seeing how science is made. I, I would imagine that uh, you know many of us, including myself, don't really have a very good grasp on how policies are made. And, I, and I'm just going to hazard the guess that uh, some of our colleagues who are policymakers probably don't really know how uh, science is really put together and constructed. And I think you know this particular program at the University of Guelph is a is a very good. Uh, vehicle and country to create that dialogue. So in, in not only it serves the purpose of bolstering relationships and strengthening those relationships, it's, it's also serving the purpose of creating a platform for, um, for us to understand better how each party works so that you know we can create an ecosystem whereby both parties, perhaps other parties can come into that ecosystem and we can all work towards uh, addressing some of these wicked problems that I just mentioned. Great, and I, 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 I thank you so much. I really agree with you about uh, training and teaching students uh, in those skills as well, other than working on their university fields and just developing their knowledge, working on those skills to communicate with the policymakers and thinking about that part too. Great, thank you so much. And as a final question, what's your opinion on the value of the Canadian Science Policy Center and its position in the community for convening, connecting, and capacity, capacity building in the science and policy landscape? Uh, I, 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 here is here's one of the big issues that um, we have in Canada. We don't really have any other forum, not as far as I know, that can replace or can complement uh, the Canadian Science Policy Center. The reality is that, and, and I, I just recently reviewed the strategic plan for CSPC, and I couldn't agree more. There are two or three different components to what uh, CSPC is doing. Part of it is to promote, as you just mentioned, convene, connect, and capacity to capacity building, both for science for policy and policy for science. I think you know these are the two components that we don't really have any other forum to be able to serve that purpose. And I think CSPC has really filled the gap quite nicely and very effectively and with a lot of impact. So I, I really want to congratulate CSPC, its president, and also its board of directors for being able to create that sort of environment for all parties involved, both from policymaking uh, um, entities and also from post-secondary educations, from funding agencies, from industry to all come together and try to understand each other each other's needs um, modes of operation and aspirations for the future and i'm always amazed that you know even though we are working in different organizations different entities sometimes different ends of the spectrum in terms of policy knowledge science etc we are all working towards the same subject which is how are we going to propel our economy? How are we going to make sure that we're not going to have food insecurity in the future? How are we going to make sure that the climate change impact on our society and our communities are going to be mitigated? And how are we going to deal with um, future issues that we have yet to see, but we know that they're going to happen, like, for example, future pandemics into, uh, and uh, that, that, that might be on the horizon. So all of those things require this sort of a highly collaborative and collegial interaction. And I think CSBC is definitely creating that platform for uh, collaborative uh, dialogues. Great. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. It was a big pleasure to meet you and talk to you. And thank you for sharing those thoughts and uh, very good suggestions with us. Uh, I wish you a very wonderful day and have a good time. Much appreciated. Thank you so much.